All right, Psalm, Psalm 16, 4 through 8. The sorrows of those who run after another god shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their name on my lips. We don't think in terms like this today. This isn't how we think about uh, the things that we are important to us today. But back then they did, and this statement like this made sense. The sorrows of those who run after another god shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their name on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lions have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night, when I'm off guard, when I may be in trouble, in the night also my heart instructs me. I set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the next week, in the next couple weeks, we're going to see uh, the culture of our town change. We're going to see the culture of our society change. Namely, that summer's over, break is over, uh, the time that we get to kind of just go do the things we want are over, think the way we want to think, talk the way we want to talk. And sometimes that can be, sometimes we can give in to idleness, sometimes we can give in to, uh, maybe we can even get into some foolishness over the summer, but Lord, mainly, we get a break from school. And Lord, education is a wonderful thing that you give us, you bless us with, but as we get around education systems, as we get around peer groups, as we get around uh, just masses of other people, and we start to feel the pressure of what our society as a whole does and says and believes and thinks when they get all together, uh, that's about to happen. And Lord, I pray that for anybody in here who, in this room, in our group, and people in our influence, Lord, who are pressured to believing certain things and acting in certain ways, Lord, I pray that you bring your spirit amongst us all and help us to root into the things that we know are true. Help us to believe the things uh, that are in your word. Be with us, God, as the uh, pathway through gets a little dicey, as our, as our channel gets a little bit rocky. Pray, Lord, that you would never leave us nor forsake us. You've promised that in your word. And thank you for that. Thank you for this group. Be with us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. This message is titled, Where Do You Stand? And it's not the message from the Grace series. If you remember the series on the doctrines of grace, there was a message in that series also called, uh, Where Do You Stand? Uh, it's the same title, but it's a different series. And like we've been doing this summer so far, I'm taking us through messages that I gave at some point in the past, I'm dusting them off and I'm doing them again. Uh, because they were either requested, like the PACT series, the series that we called the PACT, that was requested. Uh, we're doing it for that reason, or we're doing it because I believe there's something of real value, a challenge for your soul that if taken up, uh, you could potentially greatly benefit from. This message was part of a series of messages, maybe some of you guys remember this. I gave these messages over the summer of 2015, very closely on the heels of the pact. And through this series, we introduced to our youth group stories of biblical heroes, stories that happened while those biblical heroes were teenagers at the time of the story. For example, that summer I talked about King David from the Bible, maybe you remember. David went head to head in a one-on-one -on -one battle with Goliath, one of the greatest battles, one of the greatest battle stories of all time, featuring two of the greatest warriors of all time. Goliath was the champion of the Philistine army, which was what the ancient Greeks were called in that part of the world where the story takes place. Goliath was their greatest soldier. He was an unstoppable soldier, partly because not only was he skilled, but because he was a giant. He was nine foot eight. He weighed between 800 and 1,000 pounds and was probably very nearly all muscle. He was bigger than a grizzly bear. And he had the best armor. He was a Greek soldier. He was a Greek champion. He had the best armor. He was heavily armed and he knew how to fight. But even though David would become a famous and mighty warrior, at that time, he was 12 years old. He was 12. David came from the land of Israel, and Israel didn't have a lot of warriors. It did have a few warriors, and it had some good warriors. 
The king at the time was King Saul. And there's one of my favorite stories in the Bible is, is a story of King Saul's son named Jonathan. He was an awesome warrior. And he killed at one time, in one battle, he single-handedly killed 50 soldiers all by himself. So Israel's army, it did have a few really awesome warriors like Jonathan and several others. But none of them would step forward and fight Goliath. None of them. The deal on the table was that if anyone could beat Goliath, the great enemy army would give up and they'd serve Israel as slaves instead of the Philistines. This army would serve Israel. They'd stop serving the Philistines. They'd stop traveling around with the Greeks and they'd become Israeli soldiers. That was the deal on the table. Otherwise, if the Philistine won the, the battle, the one-on-one -on -one battle, the Philistines would attack Israel. Or if nobody would fight the Philistine hero, they would attack Israel. And everyone knew that there was absolutely no way that Israel could win against the Philistine army. These were the Greeks, if you guys know your ancient history. These were the Greeks. There was no way they could beat the Greeks in an all-out war. Even then, even when there was no chance, none of the great warriors of Israel, not even Jonathan, were willing to risk their own lives to save their people. Why? Because it was impossible to beat the giant. It was impossible. Every awesome move that they knew with their swords, Goliath knew that move. Goliath's sword is six feet long. That's what we know. His shield is the size and weight of a barn door. Right? Imagine you're using a barn door as a shield. You can't win. There's no way. It's not even worth a try. Even if you were to save your entire nation, wouldn't it be worth a try? Even to save your entire nation, it wasn't even worth a try. Everyone knew it. Everyone believed that. Except David. David heard this giant insult God. He hears him across the field, insulting God. Goliath insulted God, and everyone hung their heads in shame. Nothing we can do, I guess. But David was convinced that the giant would die if they stood up for God. He was, and he went around, he's like, is nobody going to fight this blaspheming giant? Oh, I guess no, no, no. David was so convinced that this giant would die if somebody would stand up for God, that he went and he killed the giant himself. The Philistines, they didn't hold up their end of the army. They ran away, only to be chased down and annihilated by this measly army of Israel, just like that. Guys, David was 12 years old. 12. How did David do that? Why did David do that? Can you imagine? He attacked a giant. He believed beyond a shadow, beyond a shadow of a doubt that he would win, but still... There was no doubt that he, he did put himself in danger, right? <laughs> Obviously. And everyone else, it looked like suicide. How could King Saul even live with himself for sending a 12-year-old to go fight the giant? No armor. There wasn't any armor that would fit him anyway. He's only 12. No armor. Armed with just a shepherd's sling that boys use to scare off wild dogs. That's all he's got. Make no mistake. David's motive wasn't that there's an enemy at large. I'm going to go kill an enemy. That's not it. Logically, everyone had resigned themselves to becoming slaves of the Philistines. It wasn't a sense of national pride. What welled up inside, David wasn't like, well, if we're going to, get, if we're going to be slaves, I'm going to go attack this giant. So that wasn't it. It was David's passion for the name and honor of God. David wasn't going to do anything with this giant until he heard that this giant was blaspheming the name and honor of God. Let me ask you guys this. Would you have fought that giant? Or would you just blend in with everyone else? Weak, like everyone else. Ashamed, like everyone else. Yeah, I know about God. I know that God is powerful. I know that God could keep my life and that he could use my life to glorify his great name like we just say. But when it really comes down to it, there's no way. Even though God's being mocked all around me, I won't risk my life to do anything about it. Guys, this is the reason I'm dusting this message off for tonight. We're only a few days away from school starting again. Some of you guys are homeschooled. You're homeschooled, so you might feel like you're off the hook for what I'm about to say, but you're not. You're not. Those of you who are in public school, you've been in public school, you're heading off to college, and there's a couple in this room who are, uh, you'll no doubt come to realize what I'm talking about tonight. Most likely you already do know what I'm talking about tonight. It's scary. 
It's scary to stand up for God in public these days, right? Going against God, going against what the Bible says is a very popular thing these days. So it's tempting. It's tempting to lay off the whole Christianity thing around certain people. It's tempting to lay off of Christianity when you get into certain situations. There may be others amongst you that you know that profess being a Christian, they claim to know Jesus, they claim to trust Jesus and to love Jesus, but everybody around you, even other Christians, they're afraid to stand up for God too. They're afraid too. So in that sense, you don't feel so bad. Everyone's not standing up for Jesus. Everyone's not. Let me tell you another story. I want to see if any of you guys can put two and two together to identify what I'm getting at tonight. Hundreds of years after this story with David and Goliath, the nation of Israel was attacked again, just like it was attacked by the Philistines, but this time Israel lost. And this time they became slaves of the Babylonians. The great Babylonian city was obviously called Babylon. In that day, it was like New York City. It was the Tokyo, it was the London, it was the Paris of its day. Babylon was an awesome city. If you're familiar with the Hunger Games, it was like the capital. It was the capital. It was the center for everything. And the king of Babylon, he demanded that Israel send their finest young men to Babylon. Basically, to finish high school in Babylon. That was, the, that was the decree from the king. All of the finest young men will finish high school in Babylon. Babylon had uh, clever teachers, and, they want, and what they wanted to do with these Israeli boys was ingrain their philosophies into the best young students in Israel. Why? Why did they want to do that? It was so that Israel would not only be a nation that was conquered by armies of Babylon, not only conquered by the armies of Babylon, but so that Israel would be a nation that was also conquered by the beliefs of Babylon. If Babylon could teach the future leaders of Israel as though they were Babylonians, then the future leaders of Israel would be Babylonian in the way they think, the things they believe. They'd be loyal to the king of Babylon. They'd be loyal to their societal beliefs and their cultural uh, heritage rather than being loyal to this God of Israel. This God of Israel that they seem to love and serve at first at least. We don't know how many young men, we don't know how many teenage boys the Babylonians captured to take to Babylon, but the Bible tells us about four of them. And their names were Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Daniel had some God-given abilities, and he stood out from everyone else. Everyone else. So the king gave him special treatment, and Daniel ended up being in charge over the wise men in the land. All the wise men in the land. David's not much, sorry, Daniel. Daniel's not much older in this story than many of you guys, by the way. He's probably just 16 or 17 years old at the beginning of this story. Because Shadrach, Shadrach Meshach, and Abednego were friends of his, Daniel got them jobs near the top, too. Remember, they're some of the sharpest, finest young men of Israel as well. But as for Daniel, Daniel lived in the palace, according to the Bible. For however long these young men lived in Babylon, they ended up having a reputation for not conforming to the culture. In this picture, in this image that I'm showing, they were offered food that was, that was forbidden for, for Israelites to eat according to the law of God. But they're in Babylon now, right? What is the saying, guys? When in Rome... Do as the Romans do. Uh, this is this predates the uh, the Roman Empire. There might have been a saying when in Babylon, do as the Babylonians do. We also have a saying you see it on TV sometimes. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Similar idea. So they're in Babylon. It's time to do what the Babylon Babylonians do. But this food that they're being offered, and there's nothing obvious about it in this in this image, um, but it's food that as as Israelites they're not. They're not supposed to eat that food, so they refused it. Anyway, however long that they'd been in Babylon for, they ended up having a reputation for not conforming to the culture. They didn't buy into Babylonian lifestyles and stuff. They were accused of paying no attention to the things that Babylonians believed. They were accused of having no regard for the cultural gods that the Babylonians held sacred. But in instead, even though their positions meant that they could have anything they want, they were, they were powerful people there. Nobody would have had anything to say if they had gone along with all this stuff. In spite of that, in spite of having all that power, they carried on as if their lives were totally loyal to their God, to the God of Israel. So at some point, the king of Babylon decided to gather all the leaders that he ruled over, 
other kings, judges, governors, senators, presidents, much of the civilized world at that time, all their rulers. And when they were all there in Babylon, he ordered his musicians to play, and while the music played, all these world leaders who fell under his rule were ordered to worship this enormous golden statue that he had built. If they didn't, or if they wouldn't physically bow down and worship that statue, the king would know, he would know who it was that isn't loyal to the society that he set up, right? And therefore, the king would throw them into a furnace to be killed. When you think about it, it's really a clever move, right? So you'll stand up for what you say you believe? We'll see. So here, all these leaders came from all over the world, and whatever freedoms they had, and the countries that they came from, they were, they were ordered to give them all up. Give them all up. Worship this Babylonian statue. The choice was either wholeheartedly become part of the Babylonian system, part of the Babylonian belief structure, or be burned to death in the furnace. That's their choice. Those are their choices. Every one of these guys was a king. Every one of these leaders was a king, or he was a judge, or he was a president or something. Every one of them had power. Every one of them had wealth. Every one of these guys had a people that obeyed everything that they said. People depended on these guys to make good decisions that kept them safe. People depended on these guys to keep them free, to keep their heritage and their cultural identity intact. But whatever they had decided or resolved to do, before this, I mean, maybe, maybe they were totally on board with giving up who they really were. Uh, maybe they were big fans of this other country's system of government. It's possible. We hear about that today. Young adults in our country are convinced that social economic strategies that resulted in the Holocaust a generation, couple generations ago are exactly the right move for us to make for our country in this generation. That's actually, that's actually a thing. You ever hear of people talking about socialism? They want socialism in our country right now. Socialism resulted in the Holocaust. That was what it resulted in. But there's a big pressure on our society today for young people to embrace socialism yet again. That's how it started in the first place. Anyway, it's conceivable that these leaders were glad about this. As the Babylonian king took over, yeah, we've always wanted to be Babylonian. That doesn't mean it was good for the people. So they probably weren't. Super glad. Regardless, when it actually came time to stand up for who they were, they decided that it was more important to save their skin. It was more important to bow down to the ground ashamed and worship the stupid statue. Nothing we could do, I guess. Just like with Goliath. Our little countries can't beat Babylon if they attack us. Our villages will be destroyed. The Babylonian king is going to burn us if we don't. It's best to just go along with this. And they did. Everyone did, except three boys from Israel. Daniel had a position in the palace, and for some reason or another, he wasn't required to be there. We don't read about Daniel in this story. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were there. And when the music played, and every one of these powerful and intimidating world leaders gave up their dignity, when they gave up their convictions, and gave up their courage, and they gave up their countries, and bowed down to the ground worshiping the statue, these three teenage boys did not. They didn't. The Babylonians have been noticing for a long time now, like I said, that these boys didn't worship their Babylonian gods. They didn't celebrate their Babylonian festivals. They didn't give in to the progressive ideologies or philosophies that everyone else gave into. They were willing to be strange. They weren't from there. They didn't want to be from there. Their hearts belonged to the God of Israel, and they wanted to live the way that God commanded them to live, regardless of how different it made them look to everyone else. By comparison, it didn't matter what people said about them. They didn't care about that. It didn't matter what people thought about them. They didn't care about that. Their hearts belonged to God. And now on this day, in front of the entire world, all the world's leaders are there. And at the threat of death, they're no different than they'd always been. The Babylonians took them before the king who ordered them to finally give up on their God. Give up on Israel. Worship their statue. Pledge their loyalty to Babylon. If they didn't, even though they were important people in Babylon, Babylon was making a big deal with these guys. Even though they were important people in Babylon, they'd be killed in the furnace. They're not on board with this king's societal influence. They're not on board with it. And like Goliath, 
the king of Babylon taunted them, saying, Who is going to save you now? Who's going to save you now? The boys responded, saying, We don't even need to answer you. We're not going to bow to your statue, and we're not going to give up our God. If you throw us into the furnace, we believe that God can save us, but even if he doesn't, we'll never serve your gods, we'll never worship your statue. And so the king threw all three of them into the furnace. The king took the three brightest and best students from the land of Israel, and he, he educated them in the best schools. He even gave them top government jobs that no teenager deserves to have. This king made these boys into rock stars. The entire nation knew who these three boys were. They were rock stars, not like Justin Bieber. They were rock stars, like the President of the United States is a rock star, right? But as soon as it was clear to the king that they were not on board with him, they were worship their one true God. They only wanted to worship their one true God. They would never true, truly be Babylonian. This king decided to kill them, and not only to kill them, but to make a public display of their death in front of all the world leaders at the time. Why, guys, why does Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego do that? Why would they defy the king's orders when there's so much for themselves at stake? Why wouldn't they just go along with everything else like everybody else did? Why didn't they just obey the king? Why did David attack the giant? Both these actions, these teenagers that we're seeing, had these two things in common, at least these two things. One is they could be killed. There's no doubt about it. They could be killed. The second that we know for sure, they had a passion for the name and honor of God. In one sense, what motivated these boys is more important than the result of what happened to them. When it came time to be identified with God, or be identified with those who mock God or disregard God, instead of being conformed to the culture around them, these boys, David, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, would be identified with God. Even if it meant they'd die. God was being mocked. They were told to just go along with it. Why didn't they? Why didn't they just go along with it? Because the name and honor of God is worth dying for. These guys were your age. Your age. Would you die for the name and honor of God? Die. How many of us would even take the risk of being considered uncool for the name and honor of God. The passion for God, the passion to confess knowing and loving God was a potential death sentence for these boys. It wasn't just being uncool. They weren't just going to be made fun of. They weren't just going to be bullied. They were going to die. I said that their motives, in a sense, were more important than the result. The motives are more important than the results. And the reason why the motive was the most important is because it proves that God has already saved them. Regardless of what happens to them, God has already saved them. After all, they, there are worse things than death, you know. Worse things. Not being with God forever is worse than death to those who love God. And for these boys to not save their skin by mocking God tells us that living this way, living in mockery of God is worse than death. To live mocking God is worse than death. But in another sense, the way this story ends is the most important thing about it. At the end of the story, the king had these three boys thrown into the furnace. And the furnace was so hot that three men who threw them in died in the heat wave once the furnace door was open. And as the bodies of the three boys fell into this furnace, the king counted them one, there goes number two, three. Hey guys, how many how many people did we just throw into that furnace? Could have sworn we only threw three in there. Yeah, King, we threw in three. But there's four in there. And they're alive. They're walking around in there. One of, the, one of them even looks like it might be a son of God. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, come out of there to me. The three teens came out of that furnace. All the leaders of the world who shamefully bowed down to that statue and gave themselves up to Babylon watched three teenage boys come out of the deadly flames and stand unharmed and unsinged in front of the king of Babylon who tried to kill them. The king said to them, Blessed be your God who has sent his, his angel to spare you, you who turned away from the king's order in order to serve God and God alone. It's a quote from the book of Daniel. And the king declared that only the one true God would be worshipped in his land, saying, for no other God, this is what he said, no other God is able to rescue in this way. What way? What way? 
And why, if dying for the name and honor of God is so honoring to God, and it is, why, if it's so honoring to God, is it important for them to be saved from this furnace? If dying for God is important, and it is, then what's the importance of being saved from this furnace? It's because no other God saves his people this way. God came to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the flesh. He came to them in the flesh, and he walked in fire with them. Do you guys remember this shirt? Uh, this shirt has a quote on it, or has a Bible reference on it, Hebrews 15, 10 through 15, and it talks about that. That's what this shirt talks about. By the way, if you wear a Christian t-shirt with Bible verses on it, that doesn't mean you're taking a stand for Jesus. It can lead you into a conversation through which you could take a stand for Jesus, but wearing the shirt doesn't. But anyway, I just wanted to, I wore the shirt on purpose tonight because this idea of igniting your faith, Hebrews, well, that's what the shirt says, ignite your faith. Great, great idea. How? Hebrews 13, 10 through 15 talks about going through fire because Jesus went through fire. God came to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the flesh. And he walked in the fire with them. He took them through fire and he delivered them all for the glory of the name and honor of God. So that all would say, God alone is God. Have you guys caught on to what I'm talking about tonight? I am talking tonight to a group of young people between the ages of 12 and 17, most of you. David was 12. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, 17. Or so. so I'm telling you this story in order to talk to you about you. David was in a battle with a giant. He was in a battle with a giant. So are you. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were being pushed into idol worship by the world around them. So are you. And you have to stand against the culture and against the gigantic sin nature in your life is going to cost you. It could cost you your life. But if your life is dedicated to mocking God along with everything else, along with everyone else, and you live out your entire life that way, it doesn't matter how much you get in this life from mocking God, you're still going to die someday. Do you know what happens when you die? You have to face God. So would you rather stand up for God today and die, or mock God for a little longer and still have to face Him anyway? We've done this before in youth group. We've turned our messages into some would-you-rather games. You guys play would-you-rather, right? And come up with all kinds of silly nonsense of horrific things that we would, would you rather do this horrific thing or embarrassing thing or this horrific or embarrassing thing. Think about this would-you-rather game. Would you rather stand up for God and die today or mock God for a little longer, maybe another 70 years, mock God for another 70 years, still have to face him anyway as a mocker? See, we have a promise from God when it comes to the pressure that you face in this world. We have a promise from God that tells us that we don't have to be afraid of what this world thinks about us anymore. We don't have to be afraid of what this world will do to us anymore. God knows how to rescue his people, 2 Peter 2, 9. And God came in flesh to rescue Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he came in flesh to rescue you. You don't need any greater proof that he's able to save your life too. You don't need any greater proof. God came as the man Jesus Christ to take your sin upon himself and defeat sin's power as if it were a giant warrior or a corrupt king so that you can be free from the fear of death. Your body will still die. Nothing we can do about that. But when you die, if your heart belongs to Jesus, you'll stand before God, not as a mocker, not as a mocker, but as a son or daughter. Because Jesus Christ bought you with his own blood when he died on that cross. Jesus came to rescue Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He saved them from fire. Jesus came to rescue too. And he came to rescue me and to save us from the fires of hell. Maybe you still don't know exactly what I'm talking about, and that's okay. If you don't, I'm just going to leave this as a mystery, but I'll end by asking you this. How are you doing when it comes to standing up for the name and honor of God? Honestly, I'd say let's make another pact. I sent it out on Facebook that way. Let's make a pact that when it comes to Jesus, when it comes to what Jesus has done for us by becoming a man and to take away our sin, or the curse of sin by dying on the cross. Let's make, a, let's make a pact that we'll never back down on standing up for him. Let's, we'll never back down from standing up for him, okay? Let's make a pact. 
Because your loyalty, either to this culture and our king, so to speak, or to Jesus and the Bible, your loyalty is constantly being demanded. Constantly. All of us are asked every day to take a stand. The scary thing is, every day we do take some sort of stand. We do. If you think that you're in neutral, you're not. You're not. It's so easy to do this. We feel threatened that if we don't stand with the culture, we might be hated. We might be mocked. We might be ridiculed. Some people in real life are spit on, swore at. They're even killed. That's, what, that's happening today all over the world. Whenever God's people, whenever they take a stand against culture, it's very true. No one wants that for themselves. I think Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego wanted to be thrown in that furnace. Or David sliced in half by an easy stroke of a giant sword. Nobody wants that for himself. No one wants to be mocked. Nobody wants to be insulted or spit on or tortured or killed. But to take a stand with the culture. If you're taking your stand with the culture, with diminishing values of American society, if we stand with society and just keep quiet about God, this would also mean that we are by default mocking God or allowing him to be mocked. Keep in mind that David didn't need to not mock God. He, he needed to not do anything about somebody mocking God to take a stand with that giant. He could have just, no, I'm going home. That giant is a fool. He could have just gone home. This was about taking a stand against a society that was mocking God. By default, you're allowing God to be mocked. It would mean mocking what God says in his word or allowing God to be mocked for what he says in his word as if, as if we never even cared that the Bible exists. We don't care that much. Will you stand for God? Or will you stand against God? There isn't a middle ground. Will you stand up for him in spite of insults? Will you stand up for him in spite of degradation, in spite of name calling, in spite of threats against your reputation? Or will you just go with the flow of things? Do you care for the name and honor of God or not? Don't think that because you're a young person, your stand doesn't matter. Three teenage boys standing up for God changed the heart of a very powerful and a very wicked king. It changed the king's heart because they took a stand. It changed the king's heart because they were put to death for taking a stand. Only they didn't die because God came in flesh to save them and no other God saves his people that way. Take a stand, guys, and you'll never truly die either. You won't. The same God came in flesh as Jesus Christ to die instead of us in order to save us and to change the hearts of this world's kids through our bold, through our bold and costly testimony of the love that God has for us in Jesus Christ. No other God saves that way. I'm standing up for him. I'm going to stand up for him. Are you? Let's pray. God, as we go to the mine on with Anthony, Lord, I pray that everybody in this room would, would get on a bus and go down and have these conversations with college students in Minot and, and hear, hear what the culture is telling us. And many, many of us already know we're in this world. We go to the, we go to school, we shop in stores, we watch TV. We know what this world, we know the way that our culture already thinks. We know what they believe. We know what they'd have us do. But as we go, Lord, and we actually ask direct questions and actually hear from people from their heart, from their, from their mind, exactly what they think about God. Um, and even as we bring reports and start talking about about what we're discovering uh, in the culture of our day, Lord. I pray that you would just enrich us with your word. Help us to take a stand. Help us to not allow your name to be mocked. It's mocked at every turn, all day long, everywhere we go. Lord, show us how to do that. I'm talking about this and we might be thinking, I don't have any idea how to stand up for God. I don't have any idea how to keep his name from being mocked. But Lord, just give us a passion for your name and honor. Trusting that your spirit will work with work through us and in us to do what it is that you would have us do when the time comes. Give us the passion for your name and honor first. We can figure all these other things out later. Help us with the passion part.